starting over again with the welcoming to everybody. Morning, Sheila. I, I'm always just a little off. Welcome everybody to starting our over. wonderful class. I know we always start, unfortunately, a little too early. I never get the welcome at the right time because of the YouTube uh, takes a minute, a second or so. But welcome everybody to our Wednesday morning class. Uh, we plan to finally name this class after nine years. We'll be naming it in six more years. So it'll be on the 15th anniversary of our first class, which will actually give it a name. Uh, this is our class in which we invite uh, the people participating to decide on the subject matter for the coming weeks. It was decided previously that we would do at least two weeks on women of the Bible. So we'll do the first part today and the second part. And if we want to do a third part, because there's plenty of women in the Bible, obviously, so it could go on for, for quite a bit longer. So welcome to everybody. Uh, this morning, we have mostly people from South Carolina, as of course, this started as a South Carolina group. But we do have one person from Georgia, which is me, and one person from Texas, which is Noel Foreman. So welcome, Noel, from Texas. Our satellite congregation there will be starting soon, and she will be running that congregation. So thank you for volunteering to do that, Noel. Uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning to Jeff and Judy and Flossie. I don't see some of you, but I see your names. So hopefully everybody is on and hope everyone is safe. So we're gonna go ahead and go to women of the Bible. Of course, any questions or thoughts you have, just bring it up because you guys obviously are very, very knowledgeable about these subject matter, uh, not just this one, but all of them. So it's great to have people participate. So when I was divvying up the class, I was trying to decide how I would divide up the class, with how, what, what organizational structure. And I said, you know, we'll just do different people. It will be as organized into categories, except for one exception. But we'll just talk a little bit about Instead of doing one session on really well-known women and one on uh, women who had a small part, um, we'll do just kind of mix them together so it won't be so just about one particular type. We're going to go over women, the, the basic premise behind what happened to women overall, and then we'll talk a little bit about individuals. So first of all, uh, for our first woman of the Bible, we're going to go right to the beginning. And that, of course, is Eve, as we all know. Many of you uh, know her very well. And we'll talk a little bit about Eve because she is obviously the first woman in the Bible. So a lot of the precedents that have been set for women in the Bible begin with her. And a lot that began with her don't go to other women. But we'll start, first of all, with the history. And I got this from Bruce Feiler's book, uh, which is a, a wonderful book, uh, not his uh, new one, but uh, a previous one. And he talks a little bit about the history of women and men in the relationship. And it starts out, he says, in previous times when we were hunter-gatherer societies. So at this point in our lives, in our history, there were no central powers. There was no central deities. Everybody had their own god of rain, of wind. Some were female, some were male. And about 12,000 years ago, we began to move from hunter-gatherer to farmer, which is very akin to Adam and Eve. If you think about it, because Adam and Eve lived in paradise in the Garden of Eden, what did they not have to do in the Garden of Eden? They didn't have to work. And so from hunter-to-gatherer to farmer, Adam and Eve lived in paradise. And when they leave, they have to begin to farm and they begin to work. So about the mid third century BCE, so around 2500, as these farmers started to gather together and create cities, as the need for food grew larger and larger as more people were born, the transition from the agricultural society to this more uh, of a society in which there was uh, some technology where people were living in cities, city states, the need for everything rose. So the res resources they had became more and more precious. And so in order to 
have access to the most resources possible, these city-states had to begin to go to war. And they had to begin to fight. And they began to have a wealthy class of people. And so this shift is the time when the shift from a more equal world to a more man taking the top role world began and continues in many ways till this day. Women started having more of a secondary role. You can see this also in the gods where it used to be men and women gods were interchangeable. Often the women gods were actually the stronger gods that all of a sudden the women gods started to lose a lot of their strength. And more and more people are looking toward male gods, especially as the strongest god. And we see a little bit of this in the Bible because in the Bible, God created this primordial human at first. It was had male and female qualities. And God says, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So some sort of he, she, first primordial animal then was separated. And then at some point, Eve became the scapegoat. Because in the story itself, she's tricked by the serpent. And because of this moment, Eve becomes the most vilified woman in human history. And there's nobody even close. I mean, for millennia, she has been blamed as the corrupter of men, which is interesting because that's one view of the way you read the story. Another view would be, they got kicked out because neither the woman or the man would take responsibility for their actions, which is probably more likely. So we see this shift from a more equal hunter-gatherer society to a more farming to a more city-state society with men now having multiple wives, men needing to have more kids because they need to have more people to work the farms, to protect the city-states, to go to war, and the women's role shrinks or becomes secondary, depending on how you look at it. And there's a great story that um, that he, he 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 gives in his book, which I um I had heard before. I don't know if you've heard this story. Uh, one day in the Garden of Eden, Eve calls out to God, "Lord, I have a problem. What's the problem, Eve? Lord, I know you created me and provided me." this beautiful garden, all these wonderful animals, and that hilarious comedic snake, but I'm just not happy. Why is that Eve came the reply from the Lord, I'm lonely and I'm sick to death of apples. Well, Eve, in that case, I have a solution. I shall create a man for you. What's a man? This man will be a flawed creature with many bad traits. He'll lie, cheat, and be vain. All in all, he'll give you a hard time, but he'll be bigger, faster, and will like to hunt and kill things. He will be witless, and will revel in childish, childish things like fighting and kicking the ball about. He won't be too smart, and he'll also uh, need your advice to think properly. Sounds great, says Eve, with an ironically raised eye. What's the catch, Lord? Well, you can have him, but there's one condition. What is that? As I said, he'll be proud, arrogant, and self-admiring, so you'll have to let him believe that I made him first. And so that goes along with my uh, Bible professor in rabbinical school's belief that creation was created in order of importance, with the least important to the most important, that each thing that was created became more important. So when I ask people, what is that, who, who, who does that make the most important? The answer, human beings, which is not correct because human beings were not created last, women were created last. And so that would make women the most important, according to my Bible professor. So these stories though, highlight the fact that Eve will become a villainous woman, the one who tempted Adam, the one who created evil on earth, the one who got us kicked out of heaven out of the Garden of Eden, the woman who is plagued with childbirth and who will die in childbirth often through the years, necessitating men to marry multiple women so they can have more kids. 
So in recent times, obviously, Eve has become more of a heroine, especially uh, and, and with the women's movement in the modern world. But for a very long time, she was the antithesis of good. Um, Larry. And you're still on mute, Larry. Am I off mute now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, a couple of things on, on Eve that um, um, the whole question of um, free will, did that come about um, as part of the creation? Uh, or when does that first show up in the Bible? Because I was just listening the other day to um, Stephen Schwartz wrote it. He, he wrote Godspell and then he wrote, oh, yeah. you know, Pippin. And he wrote, um, of course, um, the, the Wiz, not the Wiz, but, the, you know, Wicked. But um, in addition, uh, he wrote another um, show called um, Children of Eden. And in Children of Eden, he starts off with the story of Adam and Eve. And he goes through the, um, the you know, Eve eating the apple, to take the bite of the apple, and then having this conversation, which I don't think is in the Bible, about, you know, between Adam and Eve, like, we should do it. And her reasons are that, um, you know, there's a whole world out there. I know about these things, you know, and that, uh, you know, I, I've kind of seen the light, you know, let's go out and explore. And, uh, you know, so she tempts him, but she tempts him with, uh, with good intentions. And of course that, we don't know what's happening there, but uh, it, it just um, it dawns on me that, um, you know, she's been vilified, as you said, over the years as the source of, you know, original sin and, and stuff like that. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, we don't really know what happened there. And the whole question of free will enters that if, we, get, if God gave us the free will, you know, then he was just exercising her free will. Right. And that is an excellent point, Michael. Well, yeah, you know, and I remember uh, a couple of years ago when we were uh, studying Kabbalah, we had this big discussion about responsibility and, uh, it, you know, Eve versus Adam versus the snake. And, uh, you know, th this all fits, this all fits together. I don't know about neatly, but it fits together as, as a, you know, as an intellectual uh, discussion point. Oh, yeah. And it's important because, as we know, free will is, in many ways, the greatest gift and the, and the worst sorrow for our world. Free will is definitely uh, a, 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 something given to us in the Garden of Eden. When is the first moment of free will? It could be God saying, don't eat the tree. Because by saying, don't eat the tree, he is saying... If you eat it, you're going to get in trouble. That is free will right there. Because if God created human beings with the inability to eat from the tree, he would never, God would never need to say, don't eat from the tree. Other free will might be the naming of the animals. Before that, God gives the uh, character, which may be Adam, which may be primordial Adam, the ability to name these animals. And by doing that, God gives him free will to make this decision. So again, those are probably two of the first moments we see free will given. But as we see, once free will is given, that means you can make good or bad decisions, whether they made a bad decision to leave the Garden of Eden, whether they were making a decision that was needed because by giving human beings free will, it was inevitable that we would decide to leave. Think about it. If they had kids in the Garden of Eden, do you think every single kid for every generation is going to want to stay? How many people who were born in New York City say it's too boring here at 16 and move to, you know, Georgia because it's so exciting in Savannah? How many people who are born in London decide they want to go live in the country? So kids will make these decisions as they grow. So it was probably inevitable, but Eve is the one blamed. Although many scholars say the reason they were kicked out is because they refused to accept uh, consequences, uh, refused to accept the responsibility for what they did. So that was the real reason. But as we know through the ages, through art, Eve becomes the bad guy. And, uh, what, I, what was really incredible with Bruce Feiler's book is he, um, he, he got 15 minutes alone in the Sistine Chapel, which 
is obviously a very uh, rare gift. And he noted that women were not allowed in the 16th chapel until the 1700s. So who were the only women who went into the Sistine Chapel before the 1700s? The women he painted on the fresco on top, including Eve. So he painted Eve in a room where women were not allowed to go. And obviously because it was so magnificent or because he explained it in a certain way, he was given permission to do that. And so, but in the modern era, you'll really see a lot of the women of the Bible who were given bad raps we reinterpret what actually happens from a variety of perspectives. Tamar, we'll talk about um, most famously Vashti in the Purim story. She's probably second to Eve as being a villain that has now become a hero in the modern era. And so what we see from the very beginning is the Bible teaches us the way of the world, how we were in a garden of Eden which may have meant, at least to Bruce Feiler, meant that we were in a hunter-gather society, which was more equal because there wasn't a need for land. There wasn't a need to have many children to dominate your enemies. There wasn't a need for farming and having strong backs. And once we went into this new type of society, then things started to change over time. And yeah. certainly by the third century uh, BCE, when you have these nation states, which really started at the end of the fourth century, but you think of nation states in Babylon area, uh, and of course, in, or Mesopotamia and in Egypt, that's what he believes is the time period where men started to take on this roles. And you can find evidence in the gods. The farther back in time you go, the more powerful women gods are. The farther back you go in time, the more often you see the number of women gods matching or even being more than the number of male gods. Farther go back, women gods meant more than just fertility or love, but they actually could mean a variety of things. So this is a little about, about Eve. Anybody have any other thoughts on her? Uh, Flossie, and then Jeff. We'll go for, okay. We're talking about the right of choice. So there's the apple, they're in the garden. Why did God make the snake? The snake, you know, it's hard enough getting this rule and not eating, but then there comes this temptuous sliding thing in there. Uh, if they're given the choice, why did God do this to tempt them even further? And that is an excellent question. Some would say, that human beings had to, to, to be given free will, we had to learn to control temptation. Others would say the snake was just, that animals aren't given this free will that human beings are. Animals are programmed, except for dogs. Dogs have free will, are not programmed, and are wonderful and go to heaven. But every other animal is programmed. So the snake was only doing what the snake is supposed to do, to tempt to trick, but it's only human beings that can make these decisions. And so some would say Eve did it intentionally because she wanted to leave the garden. Others would say she was fooled. Others would say the reason they're kicked out of the garden is because when God asked what happened, Adam and Eve blow, Adam blames Eve, Eve blames, blames the snake. And so no one's taking responsibility. Um, but there has been the belief that Eve and even Adam wanted to leave the garden because they were getting bored or because they wondered what was on the, you know, the grass is always greener. Thank you. Jeff. A quick question. The, uh, the question was the name of the author you mentioned that who wrote on Eve, what was his name again? I missed it. Bruce File. I just use him because Bruce File is a member of, grew up in our congregation. Wonderful man. Every book he writes, uh, the most recent book, which I, I, I'm using for a sermon this weekend, is called Life in the Transitions. Uh -huh. uh, the book that he wrote about this was called, I just forgot the name of it. It's, I forgot what it's, his Adam and Eve book is called. He wrote most famously Walking the Bible. So that's what he's most famous for. His last name, Rabbi, spell it. Uh, F-E-I-F-E-F-I-E-F-E-I-L-E-R. 
E I L E R. Oh, yeah. And he wrote a book on Moses, um, Abraham, and Adam and Eve. Uh, all of them were excellent. This one I, I particularly liked, although Walking the Bible is my favorite of his book, but that's a you know most famous bestseller. So uh, yes, Larry. Oh, sorry, Jeff, you weren't finished? Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the hunter-gatherers and the farmers, it reminded me of uh, Yuval uh, Harari's book, uh, The Israeli Philosopher, uh, what he wrote about sapiens and the history of man. Uh, very good, because what you were saying brings back a lot of the things oh. he was saying in his book. You might I, want to send, text me that name of that, that which one of those? Harari. So that one. Sure. Very well known. I'll take yeah, I've, heard, I've heard of the author, but I, I don't know that I haven't read that book. Um, uh, I think it was Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Bruce Feiler, you say was a member of the congregation? Because I thought Bruce? he was a Brooklyn boy. I just saw him. No, no, he's born and raised in Savannah. His, oh. his, mother, his mother was the first woman president of our congregation. His father was a past president. They were the first couple to be presidents, you know, at the same time. In fact, his parents are both still alive, living in Savannah, dedicated members to our congregation. And wow. So. And uh, he comes. He comes back all the time for family things. They're a very tight knit family. And whenever he writes a new book, he usually comes down and promote it here. Yeah, he just uh, obviously, he's not doing it now because of I assume because of COVID. He just did an interview, I think, for um, one of the Jewish organizations that I, I watched on TV about the book that you're going to be talking about. These um, what called transitions, or oh, yeah. single and, life uh, moments that uh, you know are so pervasive. And yeah, uh, but at any rate, the question I really wanted to ask was. Um, you know, which, which is an unanswerable question is why did God not want us to eat of the tree of knowledge? That is the question, isn't it? You know, is it that God didn't want us to do it or did God wanted us to test the limits of our boundaries? Or is it that God felt that human beings had to have this decision and had to learn to exercise control and obviously they didn't have it in the beginning, but nobody knows exactly why, you know, it's the age old question. Um, don't play with that doll and you put the doll in the room of your son or daughter right in the center. And you say, don't play with it. Really? I mean, what is the first thing any kid going to do? Um, so it's a, uh, it's, that is an issue that is discussed at length all the time. And some would say God really wanted them to, but they need to take responsibility. Others say God was testing their limits. There's a wide range. Some would believe that God had decided he didn't want human beings to be immortal. And the only reason they were immortal is because one of the trees they were eating, allowed to eat from gave them immortality. But as soon as they left the garden had no longer had access to that fruit, whatever it is, they weren't immortal uh, anymore. They were no longer more, uh, immortal. So... Lots of things, but throughout the ages, there are whole books written on the sinister nature of Eve and how she has been used as a way to demonize women or to keep women in their place and how um, that has really been something that a lot of people have tried to change in recent, recent years, certainly the last 50 years, probably. So she, Eve is obviously the first woman that you know, is discussed in the Bible. But there are other women who I would say have a interesting life and were faced with the dilemma and had to act in ways that would not have been deemed appropriate. And some of them were not vilified, but were venerated for this act. And probably the best example is Tamar. Tamar is probably the best example of a woman who had, who was forced to use her available options, which would be considered sinister, but there was no other chance for her to succeed. So if you don't know the story of Tamar, uh, it's a story from Genesis um, chapter 38. So Tamar is married to Judah's son. Now Judah, of course, is one of the 12 sons of um, Jacob. He will end up being the leader of the family, whereas Joseph will be the grand vizier of Egypt. Judah will be the head of the family. Obviously, he is 
Judah of the tribe of Judah, named after him. And of course, that will be the most prominent and most powerful tribe with the famous kings all coming from that tribe, including, of course, the first king from that tribe, David. So Judah has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah, or Selah, depending on how you look at it. His first son, Ur, is married to this woman named Tamar. So very normal, but Er does something wrong and he dies. We don't know what he did wrong. It just said he was wicked. And obviously when he dies, as the Leverite marriage rules state, he had no son. So his daughter was given to, I mean, his wife was given to the second son, Onan. And so she marries Onan. Obviously, there's a lot of issues with the Leverite marriage. Why? Because the first son, let's say, theoretically, Larry, you and I are brothers. You're, you're my older brother. I'm the younger brother. You know what? I'll be the older brother. I'm the older brother. I die. I have no kids. You marry my wife. That first kid is considered my kid. And so he may, he may get a double portion above your kids, any other kids you have, even if you have had kids before. And so there's all these issues that we're not so sure. Anyway, he dies. So Onan dies. He did something wrong. We don't know what it is. And so Judah has an issue. Both his sons have been married to this woman. And both have died. So obviously it must be her fault. She's cursed. And so he says, you can marry, as the rule state, you will marry my third son, but he's not of age yet. However, she finds out that he is not planning to marry her to him at all. This is an issue. Because she's still considered married to him, even though she will never be married to him. So what does that mean? It means she's stuck. She can't get married. She can't have kids. She can't leave the family. She is stuck in kind of a purgatory type place because she's legally married, but she's also legally unmarried. And But she's legally part of this family, even though he's left. So she doesn't know what to do. So she devises a plan. After Judah's wife, dies, Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute. And obviously prostitution was a profession at that time. And so he goes to an area where these women are, and she's wearing a veil. And so they sleep together. And when he wakes up, he wants to pay her with his staff, his seal and his cord, um, he, or he doesn't have enough money. We're not sure exactly why he leaves the staff seal and cord there. But when he goes to collect it, nobody's ever heard of this prostitute. So instead of payment, she gets this, the seal and his staff and all these things that are very obviously his. So it's basically, it says a staff seal and his cord, probably his belt, obviously. And so three months later, he hears that Tamar is that pregnant. So, which is impossible because she is not allowed to sleep with anyone except for her husbands, both are who are dead. And so the first thing he says is we should kill her. She's obviously broken the law. We need to stone her because actually I think it's burn her. We're going to burn her to death. And so when he takes people there with him to arrest her and to have her burnt, he sees that she is holding staff, steel, and cord, and he realizes that he is the one who has slept with her. And so he realizes that's his epiphany moment from where he becomes kind of a sleazy guy to the leader of the house of 
of, of Jacob and to this really amazing person. And it was her who knocked some sense in him. So what we read is that she and him will have twins. Obviously, twins are something that has uh, happened in the family for. And one of the sons' name is going to be Peretz. And that is the name of a descendant of King David. So their child will be the first in line or whatever. And eventually King David will come from this line. So in other words, Tamar's actions have been sanctioned not only by Judah himself, but by Jewish history. Because King David comes from this line. And so it begs the question, if King David didn't come from this line, would Tamar be vilified like Eve? But since King David came from the line, it's okay. However, we do see the Bible, which is way ahead of its time when it, and it's uh, the way it treats women, way ahead of its time, comparatively speaking, shows us that this woman was unfairly treated. Tamar was given a very difficult set of options. She is basically in a no-win situation. Her life is ruined. Um, and yet she devises and schemes and ends up setting the precedent. What other woman, we're not talking about, did the same thing? What other woman previous to her schemed? And that would be Rebecca. Delilah? Huh? Delilah later. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. Delilah does scheme too. But earlier is Rebecca. Rebecca schemes to convince Isaac that Jacob is the eldest son. Remember that? Is she vilified for that? No, because it's God who asked her to do it. She is fulfilling the role she was given. She has been told that the younger son should be in charge. This is how she decides to do it. In other words, what we see from Eve, Tamar, and Rebecca is this need for a woman to scheme a little bit behind the scenes because that's the only way she can do it. She is not empowered enough. And so the scheming in some ways is legitimized if it's for the greater good. So in other words, the Bible gives, I don't know if the Bible gives permission, but certainly in certain cases, the Bible does give permission to act in this way for women to go into the background, but manipulate the situation. Obviously, all of these incidents could be shown in negative lights, as with Eve, although in the Bible, Eve is probably not shown as a negative a light as she is in later days with the interpretation of the situation. So Tamar, like Rebecca, has to go to extreme lengths, lengths she almost certainly did not want to go to in order to secure a place for her in the world because obviously she is childless, legally married, but legally unmarried. And, and basically in a no-win situation. Now she has two children, both men, through Judah directly. So even though they're not the eldest sons, because he still has one son from the previous generation, they obviously are entitled to a piece of his property and his name. So those are really interesting women to talk about and how the role of women was marginalized the Bible certainly gives them more opportunity than probably writings of any other age at the time, but not nearly what they probably would have had if it was written 2,000 years earlier. Uh, Larry. Yeah, just go back before Rebecca to Sarah for a minute. And, um, you know, Sarah, of course, is venerated as the, um, you know, the first woman, so to speak, even, you know, that's really venerated. Uh, but I came across this interesting article in um, the newspaper of the time, which is from the 12th of Nisan in the year of 
2069 BCE. And it says... It's amazing to have these articles. To have this, yeah, yeah, this is priceless. And it says, I'll hold it up. It says, the court rules that Hagar stays and it affirms uh -huh. Neil's rights. And in it, the ruling was based on excerpts from the law of Hammurabi bearing on the Sarah Hagar case. So apparently <laughs> that was used as a justification for, uh, I mean, the, the Israeli law or the law that Abraham sought to, uh, you know, not impose, but I mean, he, Sarah basically convinces him to, you know, tell Hagar she's got to go and Ishmael's got to go, right? Not a great thing. Um, so, um, but the Hammurabi law would have substantiated the fact that she was legal at the time. And later, opposition to the Jewish law. And actually, as I remember hearing some people talk about the Quran, in the Quran, Abraham actually does escort her and he's much kinder to her. It's a much nicer story as far as um, Ishmael. And he brings her into Egypt and he brings her with the son, you know, and he provides for her so that it's not as harsh as the, the villainous part. But yet, Sarah never gets vilified for that even though it's against the, you know, what would have been the prevailing law at the time before, you know, Jewish law even. This is yeah. a book called Chronicles, which is interesting. We used to give this to the uh, religious school children. Uh, it was newspapers of the time from Genesis. It's amazing that English has been around so long and it really hasn't changed much. Yeah, and photographs. Yeah. <laughs> But again, it's all about perspective. Sarah is not necessarily vilified for this, although it looks like she is doing something wrong. Obviously, though, she is worried about her son and the role he will play in the family in future generations. So Jewish law would also agree that, um, that Ishmael would have been the eldest son because we have it that the eldest son is the eldest son, no matter what uh, bride it comes from. So again, it's always about perspective. There's a very difficult way in which the Bible can lionize or ostracize people. And what we see is all these great leaders do terrible things and need to overcome their own uh, feelings and their own biases to do the right thing. And yeah, so again, we see it with uh, Sarah as well. I mean, she really, from our modern perspectives, does not come out looking good in the Hagar story. But at other times, she may have looked good because she was protecting her son. Um, because who knows if she thought Ishmael might do something to her son as they grew older, who knows, or that her son was going to be left out. It's impossible to know. Or that God actually spoke to her and said, your son is going to be the one to take on this role, just like it was with Rebecca. So those are good questions. Any other thoughts before we move on? I feel like we're rolling now. I feel like I should sing from what's the, what's Rawhide? Rolling, 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 right? Yeah, it's Rawhide. All right, so the next two, and we're gonna go in order of uh, where the people come from. So right now it's chronologically, but I wanna talk just a bit about Shifra and Pua because obviously they're two of my favorite women in the Bible. We don't know very much about them. There's only about a paragraph about them. These were the midwives that were ordered by Pharaoh to kill all the firstborn boys coming from the babies. Um, so I'm coming from the Jewish women. Obviously, Pharaoh didn't know much about reproduction. It probably wasn't smarter to, you know, to kill the women because they're the ones where children come from, but they, he was, I think, more worried about an uprising in the years. So he said, kill all the men. And these, kill all the boys. And these women stood up to him and said, no. They basically said, the women give birth so quickly, by the time we get there, the baby's already born and is gone, and they're hiding the baby. We don't know if Shifra and Pur were Israelites or whether they were Egyptians but they really make a name for themselves, not just because of their bravery, but because the bravery goes far beyond what we first might think from our perspective. So what do I mean? Pharaoh has ordered 
these two women, let's presume they were Egyptian, to deliver and then kill all firstborn, all boys. When he says what happens, they stand up to him and lie. They are so strong that they deliver the baby themselves, and then the baby's gone by the time I get there. It seems like some sort of civil rights, you know, standing up for who, what you believe. It seems like these are very brave women, but that's only from our modern sensibilities. If we go back in time to that age, their bravery far exceeds anything we can imagine because they're not standing up to a human being. They're standing up to a God King. Remember, Pharaohs were imbued with the powers of gods or looked as connecting themselves or even being gods themselves. And he, they are standing right in front of him and lying to basically a god to protect these babies. That is pretty impressive. So their heroism is vast. I mean, vastly related. Rabbis praise them left and right. There's a few rabbis that say every kid born owes its life to them in the Jewish world, even to today. So what we see is women who are standing up against all odds and may not even be Jewish, and yet they are venerated at a very high level. One of the few people in the Bible who do no wrong that we see. And so again, they got a paragraph, that's it. They don't, there's not much known about them after that. I think I mentioned once more, maybe, um, but that's it. And so this is why they considered, they, they, they remain part of our, you know, canon because of this belief. Any thoughts on Shifra or Pua? Uh, Jane. And you're still on mute, Jane. Thank you. Is this only rabbis from the reform? No, no, no. Shifra and Pua have been venerated from thousands because, of years. Because if, in fact, a person believes that the only way a baby can be born who's Jewish is if the mother is Jewish then why would they praise these women? The men, the man grows up. Yes, I know, you know, that the woman raises the child, generally speaking. But it seems odd for me for them to have made this distinction if in fact they really do think that they did such a wonderful thing, and they did in my eyes. But I, I just don't understand why the father claiming that it is the father, you know. Well, biblical law, if you're the father's Jewish, you're Jewish. It's not till much later that it becomes that you're the mother Jewish, you're Jewish. Um, but there's oh. probably a couple. Yeah. So biblically, the man is uh, it, it, it goes to it's a patriarch that determines um, but also, and Pharaoh was fearful of a coming battle in the years to come, and obviously, more men might have been another reason why. So, but yeah, I mean, again, I don't know if Pharaoh was that bright, actually, you know. <laughs> you know he was born into his role, his IQ was right around 99. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, Einstein here. So, but uh, again, even though they have so little time, they're de generally considered heroes, uh, heroes, their heroines, sorry. All right, any thoughts on them? Uh, Larry. Yeah, uh, another person that, that comes to mind is um, the Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, she doesn't seem to get uh, enough credit for, um, she must have known what was going on. And the fact that when she rescues, you know, Moses in the reeds or in his basket or whatever, that he must have been a Jewish child. And, uh, you know, yet she is, um, you know, basically uh, taking him in. Uh, so she is defiant of her father and we don't hear anything about her, uh, but she obviously is a very noble character. 
In fact, the second and third chapter of Exodus, especially the second, is the, the moment where women are, 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 are projected as leaders more than anywhere else. It's the moment where women are given the most acclaim because it's the Moses story. The Moses story is all about women saving him. First of all, Shifram Pua. Second of all, his mother, who takes him and puts him in a basket. Third, his sister, who walks with the basket. And when he's picked up, the sister says, oh, I know this woman who could nurse right now. So she gets her mother, and her mother gets to be the nursemaid of Moses. And then, of course, Pharaoh's daughter. So you've got five women who determine the course of Jewish history. Shifra Pua, mother, sister, Pharaoh's daughter. So those five women really take over the narrative at the very beginning of the Moses story. And it's really quite incredible that they all are heroes in very different ways. The bravery is very different. Two women who stand up to Pharaoh, a mother willing to give up her son to save him, a sister willing to go quietly with the illegal baby, knowing if she's caught, she will be killed. Pharaoh's daughter, who is going to raise what probably everyone in court knows is a slave child as her own. So it's really quite impressive, the women of this moment and what they do. In fact, in the movie, um, the, movie the Ten Commandments, I'm trying to remember, I think Pharaoh's daughter goes with them in the, into the desert, doesn't she? We don't know if she did or didn't. We don't know if she's still alive. But in the movie, I think Moses takes his, you know, his uh, mother with him. Not just Yochabed, but the Egyptian woman who was his mother. So, very interesting to see how women are portrayed in this in this story. Any other thoughts? We'll do one more. If there's not, oh, Flossie, sorry. Why? And this is not the only time we're introduced to someone in the Torah, and it's almost like a footnote, a quick paragraph, and poof, they're gone. Why, like here with Miriam, we don't know much of what happened to her. She appeared, she did her job, and she's gone. Why yeah, and again, that? well, and a lot, of, it's not just women that happens to, although it's often no, with men. I mean, there's just so many characters, and the stories always center on a few characters, and the other ones just stay on the periphery. It's like anything else, you can't go in depth to every single character, and then, because then the book would be impossible to read. So these two women had their moment, and then we have no idea what happens to them. I mean, we know, that we know they're not killed, that they live happy lives, because it says that at the end, but we don't know anything specific about them. But you're right. It would be great to have other books about these people and what they did, Shifrim Pua, Melchedek, all these people who have one paragraph but make a huge impact. But Miriam is... Am I on? When nope. you have your spare time, you could write another book. Continue I could, I could that. write. Yeah. That's Actually, why we have novels. <laughs> that's right. My spare time is for my best friend, uh, Nett. His last name is Flix. And that's my, that's my best friend right now. Are there Midrash on those uh, characters? Oh, there is an enormous amount of Midrash. I'm sure from Pua. Midrash, commentary. Yeah, they are, they are very prominent for such a small role. Do they end up in, in, in a good life? or? Oh, they... yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think in the Bible, is it the Bible or Midrash that says they live good lives? Uh, I'm forgetting. I think it's the Bible that says it, and, but it's in, again, um, often they are credited with Jews being alive today, the Jewish religion remaining today because of their role, saving Moses, saving all these other babies and thus saving the Jewish world. Did Moses' mother and Miriam leave e uh, Egypt when Moses left? Yeah. They Actually, did. yeah, Miriam did. I, yeah, the mother was still, I think she was still alive. No, nah, she may not have been alive. I got to remember, I got to check if Yochabed was alive. I think she was. I think she went into the desert as well. 
we do that uh, song of Miriam with the timbrel at the right. across the yeah. sea, you know. With, uh, well, well, Miriam, Miriam was important in the desert because she was the one that was able to find the Mayim. And we'll, we'll start with Miriam now. Now, Miriam yeah. is an extremely interesting character on many levels. She is probably after the matriarchs, the most famous woman, maybe even more famous than they are, uh, because she comes from Exodus, which is, you know, a much more important book in terms of our history. But even though she is so famous, you have to realize she's almost in a smaller section of the Bible as Shifra and Pua. I mean, she's only mentioned like four, like five times by name, I think, maybe four times, maybe by name. And one. So even the little girl who walks with the basket in the river, we don't know if it's Miriam. We just know it's Moses' sister. For all we know, he had another sister who died earlier or who lived is never mentioned again. We never hear if Miriam has, is married or has kids. She only speaks, I think, three times. And every, almost every story, or at least out of the four major stories, five major stories with her, if you count her being the sister in the, bringing the baby in the river, Two out of the five are negative stories. Two out of the five are negative. One's her dying. So the only two stories which are happy are really leading the people in dancing and escorting her brother to safety. And we don't even know if that was her. I mean, it's assumed by a lot of people, but you know, why didn't they mention your name? So Miriam, we hear about her after we leave Egypt. So I don't believe she's even mentioned during the 10 plagues, this whole time with Moses and Aaron approaching Pharaoh, the back and forth, that she's not mentioned. The first time she's mentioned by name, I believe, is after we cross the sea, she leads the people in dancing, or namely the women in dancing over this incredible show of power by God and their freedom. That's, that's when we hear her name the first time. If she is the woman who escorted Moses, and Moses is 80, she's 90-ish. So she's not a young woman. So if she could have had kids, she may not have had kids, we don't know. The other two, oh, Judy, please. Oh, I was going to say in the movie, um, the, the Yochebed and um, Miriam live because Moses find them later in the leper camp. Is that is that true or is that just part of the movie? I think that's been her. <gasps> Am I in the wrong movie? I think that's the wrong movie, yeah. Oh, sorry. I remembered <laughs> that, that there were lepers. <laughs> I think that was been her, right? <laughs> that's where I get, get all the my lepers are cured, yeah. Okay. Wrong movie, wrong religion. <laughs> <laughs> Same actor. <laughs> that's true. It was confusing. Quite frankly, even a better actual movie, probably the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, but, it didn't uh, have a Chariot race and yeah, that chariot animals. race where real where people actually died in reality. <laughs> yeah. That was the okay. that chariot race is pretty awesome. All right, so let's 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 talk more about Ben Hur. So that's a joke. We're not talking about Ben Hur. So Miriam has become a major figure in the Jewish world, really in the last fifty years, more so than probably at other times. Although she has been referred to as a prophetess, we'll talk more about what that means later. Um, she's always been a major character, but she really has a minor role because the only other two stories we hear from her, if it is Miriam, baby in the basket, leading people dancing, then we hear about her rising up against Moses two different times. One time she gets upset at Moses because her and Aaron are upset because they don't believe they have the same relationship with God as Moses. Another time, Aaron and she rise up against Moses because they don't like the woman she's, he's married to. So she leads these minor rebellions twice. She's given leprosy and she's cured. And then she dies. And she's given a, a, a minor to do when she dies. So that's where we, that's the only time we see Miriam. So she's been given this role as the great leader of the Jewish world. 
and really leading with the idea that she led from behind, that she was probably the spiritual guide of Moses, the kind older sister who supported him and helped lead the people, not in an official role, but in an unofficial role, kind of the unofficial mother of the Israelites. And that's what she's seen as today. But again, she does not have many more lines than Shifra and Pua. So it's interesting how in the modern world, we have need to find women heroes. And the farther you go back, the more proof you can give that women have been part of the leadership and heroines throughout history. And Moses and his sister, well, Moses being the most important character, his sister has become in many ways the most important woman in the Bible. And so, again, we leave it up to modern scholarship to see how we can continue to use her. A lot of people venerate her for stepping up to Moses and saying, it's not just you that God loves, God loves off all of us. Or stepping up and saying, you should not have married that woman, you know, for whatever reason, she is not good for you. We don't know the specifics. So any thoughts on Miriam? I know uh, Judy, since congratulations again uh, for all the stuff you're doing in Hadassah. And I know Miriam is very big in Hadassah and in sisterhoods as she should be, but it's really been something akin to Eve. She was never considered a villain like Eve. She was just considered Moses' sisters who, who really had an important role, but not as major of a role as Moses or Aaron. And in the modern world, that has changed. I'd say many people, I'd say she's probably bigger than Aaron in the modern world. More, more talked about, more recognized than, than Moses' brother. That's how important she has become. Well, I was going to say, too, since the advent of the woman Seder, which was started by I, Debbie Friedman, and I was lucky enough to go to one of her Seders in New York with oh, nice. about 300 women. The only men that were there were in her band. And um, it was it was pretty incredible. But, you know, and then, of course, she wrote the song. But um, in, in women's satyrs, Miriam is the main attraction. So, yeah. so since that's become I think you're right. I think that has been one of the things, especially in the reform and conservative world, yeah. the idea of Miriam's cup, because there's <laughs> nothing that says you can't have Miriam's cup. You're you know, you just have to have all these other things. So right. but she's, she's added that. Yeah, she's become really probably the most venerated woman in the Bible in the modern age. Since you mentioned, <laughs> and let me just throw in a plug that I just saw, I think it was from uh, uh, Terry Weintraub and Temple Osa Shalom just sent out a, uh, a notice that there's a, um, a film, a free film on Debbie Friedman. Um, I oh, really? I've seen that, yeah. Uh, I'll try and find that and send the link. I, yeah. those I think that also if Temp Temple Osa Shalom can find it, but you have to register for yeah. it. Yeah. It's um it's Thursday night at eight. It, it's not from I mean it's it's I forget who was sponsoring it, but um and today if we're talking just to give a little plug but you know today is you know, uh, the ho today's Holocaust Remembrance Day right. and there's a terrific um uh, from the <clears throat> Holocaust Museum there's a program tonight with poems from young uh, Jewish poets and whatever at eight o'clock, which is also oh, interesting. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> the Reasonable Center has a film tonight as well. There's so many things going on. A today. lot of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and also to to Shvat is you know tomorrow. So right. more stuff. So there's a lot going on. Yeah, we're Judy, gonna. We're, um, will you send out the link since you have it for the um to to the um to the people that are in our group here, the McRisville group, or? Yeah, are you talking to me or Judy? Talk to me. I don't have, yeah, yeah I don't have, okay, yeah, Judy, that'd be great. Oh, for the Debbie Friedman thing? The Debbie Friedman link, yeah. Is, is it Thursday tomorrow night? Yeah. The Debbie Friedman is, is tomorrow at 8. Okay. Tonight at 8 is the Holocaust. Well, yeah. there's a bunch Hebrew of Holocaust. College, I think they're sponsoring it. Hebrew Union College. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, Judy, if you can't find it, I'm pretty sure I still have that email. Yeah, yeah I'm looking right now, so. Right, thanks. All right, so that was a little bit what we're going to look at next week is we're going to start off looking. We didn't get quite to it today. Look, we looked at the first female prophet, Miriam. We're going to look at the next two, although sometimes Sarah and a few others are considered prophets only 
really three are named prophetesses. We're going to talk about the difference between the woman prophet and the male prophet. And then we're going to talk about a few other characters. If you want to look up anything, when I picked out, we're going to look at, oh, sorry, I said that the two prophetesses. And then we'll look at uh, uh, Ruth, Esther, and Hannah. And then maybe Rahab as well. And then if we have time, the Witch of Endor. So those are the kind of the ones I've chosen. Pretty exciting stuff. Thanks again. Is everybody doing all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Rabbi, I just sent you both of the <clears throat> those emails for those two events. I didn't have everybody's addresses, so you can okay. really send them. I don't have everybody's addresses either. I'll send oh. them to Larry or Sheila. They think you, you guys have them all. Actually, I may have it. I may have them all in the email Larry sent me. So, okay, Larry, you have them. Yeah, I, I have them. So if you send it to me, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, follow I'll, I'll, I'll send them to you. Okay. I don't know if everybody's on the list, but um, I don't have uh, the the lady that was just on. I think she went off from um, Texas. Or, uh, oh yeah, the Noel Glee. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, but uh, I don't have hers. But maybe you could forward it to I'll her. I'll forward it to her. Are you sending up a little satellite group? Did I hear from Texas now, or was that just a pun? That, no, that was a joke. That's uh, Noah okay. comes and joins us from Texas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jess, oh, Jess so joins us from Virginia. Satellite group in Texas. Now. Yeah. Sounds yeah. real. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Think we could, yeah. We're going to convert Texans to become Georgians. <laughs> <laughs> are you doing the four clergy today, Rabbi? We are doing the four clergy today, and then I'm. Uh, Tomorrow, you're on Ollie. I'm on Ollie tomorrow. Ollie. And yesterday I interviewed the uh, really interesting lady from the Savannah Tree Foundation. And then Saturday, we had a great interview with Todd Young from APAC. You have a chance talking about the peace process between Israel. That we heard. Yeah. That was very good. He's the, that, both, uh, that was really uh, well done. I learned a lot. The lady yesterday, Zoe, was very good on the Yeah, she was too. Yeah. That as well. yeah, that was very interesting about the... Uh, you know, the trees and also the possibility that you might start a joint program of uh, commemorating. The trees. I think we would love to do that. We should have done it for this week for Tubishvat. Uh, all we're doing is I did that. And my wife is doing a planting today in Daffin Park for her and a couple of kids. But you can't, you know, you try and get all the families together, but I don't want to get all the families together because it's, you know, not everybody feels comfortable doing it even outside. So it's kind of like I'm alienating people. It's a catch 22. So, yeah. But as always, it was awesome studying with you guys. Next week, we'll do Jewish Women of the Bible 2. And uh, we do have um, the meeting, this uh, synagogue uh, meeting on Sunday at 3, just for members. And then we have services. And then Tim's doing his classes. And then we'll have the Holocaust thing tomorrow night. And I'll probably get to watch the Debbie Friedman one. I, um, so that'd be nice. Yeah, looking forward to hearing your comments on the Bruce Feeler book. I heard the interview and it's it's quite an interesting. We, I did not see the interview. I have not. I'm just starting to read the book. I'm just using it as the basis for sermon, just a little bit, but I'll read it. Okay. And then a lot of meat in there. It's a good book to discuss. Uh, yeah. 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 He's he's really, really top notch. I read his book on Abraham, which is absolutely. A yeah, story. that's a good one. This is a video on walking the Bible that was on PBS. It's, uh, just, it's marvelous. Yeah, and he wrote a book, Council of Dads, which is really good. And the TV show, although it was canceled, uh, they filmed it in, in Savannah. So they got, I think they got one season or half a season. Uh, but he, he insisted they film in Savannah. Because, you know, all the, all the movie studios were leaving Georgia because of the various issues. And so he said, basically, you know, they asked him, Do you, does this have to be in Savannah? He said, yes, it does. And so he's a, he's a real mensch. Although now, because of what happened with the last election, I imagine, the, the, who knows, maybe the movie fest will come back. It's hard to tell these days. You know, okay. you know, with all filming's all kind of stopped now. everywhere. Where does he live? He lives, I think, in New York now. That, that's what I thought. I thought North it was somewhere. for some reason yeah. that, that he lived in. Yeah. Bruce <laughs> His brother lives in Atlanta and his sister lives, I think, in New York as well. Maybe maybe in Boston. He's somewhere up north. I get very confused with all those northern places. Yeah. Um, no, it doesn't say where he's living. I think it's in New York.
but he's a really nice, really terrific guy. So uh, we're very, very uh, proud to have him as a person who grew up here. So everyone stay safe. Enjoy yourselves as much as possible. Good luck in getting the first or second shots. I know you told me they've kind of paused there up there, but hopefully they'll get back going. And if you need anything, good luck. And if you need anything from me, let me know, guys. I will see you, you today. I hope. Right, hey, Rabbi, are you going to reschedule that drive-in service? Or we are. We just haven't done it yet. We probably could yeah. have done that. Although, I mean, it was just really windy. It was if it was in the high, wow. it would have felt like it was in the 30s. But uh, wow. but we'll probably do it for March. We were so excited. We went the week before and then realized we were there on the wrong date, but nobody else was there. <laughs> well, it was a lot. We didn't have very many people ordering lunch. Yeah, we don't. The week of the the uh, the the riots had just happened. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then and then it was freezing cold, and it was going to be the only day of the week where they're going to have twenty five mile an hour winds. Yeah, and we didn't know if we had an idea. We just said, <laughs> okay, we'll set up. We got to do that soon. A wise uh, move. Yeah, it wasn't my. I I voted to keep it going. I was uh, outvoted. <laughs> so it was if it was a wise move, that probably was because I didn't want to do it that way. <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Tadarabha. Judy Mazel Tov again. Oh, thank you. Thank you.